Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lena Saleh. I am the EdTech Guru, where we focus on all things EdTech and education related. Please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment below. All right, let's do this. Today I wanna to talk about how teachers' use of EdTech tools need to evolve moving forward. When the pandemic started, there were 9,000 resources available. You can listen to Ed Search podcast, Education Dive, any kind of podcast that you could pretty much find anywhere that's highlighting how parents were feeling during this time is overwhelmed. Even teachers themselves that have students in other classrooms were feeling overwhelmed because there were so many tools and tool sets to navigate. So as a school and as school leaders, a educational leader in your classroom, in your field, in your grade level, you need to determine certain tools that are going to be necessary school-wide that you're gonna to want to implement. So maybe for your K2, you're doing Seesaw, maybe for your upper grades, you're doing Google Classroom. Try to keep some sort of consistency in flow and make that flow happen all the way up from K to 12 because parents have a really hard time navigating that. The most beautiful thing that we saw during this time is more parent engagement than we've probably seen in the last 20 years of education. As our lives have gotten more complicated, the engagement from parents has really declined. I don't mean parents showing up to teacher conferences. I'm not talking about how much they come in to help with PTA or coming to watch their students do sports. I'm talking about the true engagement in the classrooms. It's hard to get room parents. It's really hard to have that parent engagement back and forth. And the only time that you're really actually truly having that engagement is during those parent teacher conferences between the parent and the teacher. There's constant communication happening from the principal in weekly newsletters and your weekly newsletters, but the true open door policy between the two hasn't really existed for a really, really long time. When you streamline those tools, it's really important. The second part of that is to create, and nobody has really been thinking about this, but to create a learning database for parents. I know that it takes a lot of time, but you can divvy up the task amongst each other. So the K2 takes care of the seesaw, the two, three takes care of like an IXL type of math program or whatever programs you've decided to utilize in your school, this parents need to be able to have access to it. So think about you teaching your students the very first time you want to do the same thing for parents. Create a library of resources for your parents to help them engage with their students. A lot of times the lack of engagement happens because parents don't understand what's happening in the classroom. And I'm not talking about your communication about what you're doing on the day to day, but they don't understand how the new math works, how the new writing works. Our systems have changed throughout the years. So something how I would have learned when I was in kindergarten is not the same way that a kindergartner learns today. We're really about number sense, really honing in on what does this number exactly mean? Parents didn't learn that way, right? From research shows that we really didn't understand why we need to have the value of the number and that's why all the other approaches have come into play for whole learning for all of our students. But, but parents don't really understand that. So creating a library of resources is really going to create greater parent engagement for the parents. And if we can support the parents, they're actually gonna support the students and we'll have a much more harmonious team for our students. So really creating that that library of resources for parents and streamlining the tools that we use. There are tons of really cool tools to use and keep those kind of in your classroom. They don't really need to be doing them at home. Focus on tools that the parents can support their students at home. Also, when you're thinking about that, think about what tools can be utilized across a multitude of dev devices. I know that personally utilizing devices, an iPad to a Kindle Fire, which who loves utilizing those in e-learning? Nobody really, but people have them at home or a PS4 system or something like that. Think about the tools that can run across a gamut of, of devices because sometimes the program won't work on a mobile device, but will work on a Chromebook that won't work on an iPad. And so they're not actually device agnostic. They actually don't work across a multitude of devices. So kind of keep that in mind as well when you're selecting those tools that parents can help with and that you're creating that library of resources, both in a print version and in a video recorded 
version, something that's quick for the parents to navigate and utilize. So put them also in the LMS system so they have more familiarity with the tool itself as well. The next thing is that we really saw the lack of equity happen during this time. And I'm not just talking about amongst devices, but also with internet resources. Some people had hotspots. I know that me working from home, our internet slowed tremendously, tremendously from the time that COVID-19 started to basically now, it's still been very, very slow in comparison to what it was beforehand. And that's the way that the networks are set up. They're set up for a flow. I live in downtown, so they're closer to downtown area. The network is much faster than as you move out forward. The networks would transition, if you think about it in a sense, that the homes would have more bandwidth in the, after, in the evenings and the businesses would have the bulk of the band, bandwidth during the day. So we started to see that where the businesses didn't no longer need the internet connections and we started to see that the internet connection slowed. So just kind of keeping that in mind and also providing parents with resources of what to do if you don't have internet. What can the parents do to support the kiddos? This also takes an extra step, but also in the long run is going to help your students we know that it's never going to be 100% across the board. There will always be students that are way further ahead and students that are way further behind. We're talking about the greater average of students. Unfortunately, I hate to say that, but it's the truth as far as that goes about how we can kind of support them. So if they don't have the money and funds, is there a way that we can provide them with a resource for how to get internet at home there's a lot of ways that we can kind of help support them and that will help alleviate the stress off of your shoulders if the parents are helping to support on their end. Let's say another COVID case breaks out or something happens in which we really do need to mix up our school days because it's too expensive to run a five day work day or you know, those things might change as we progress through the years. There might not be five days of education, there might be three or there might be a week of snow days that you have at home learning taking place. And then the last part of that piece is going to be the planning piece of it. So I know that teachers did an amazing job, I've mentioned this before, of flying by the seat of our pants, which we do on a daily basis. But what happens when you switch to this more immersive online learning experience is you have to be really well planned. It's hard to throw something together within five minutes. You can't just run to the copier, make a copy and come up with some kind of an assignment to utilize within your classroom. When you do so, if you think about it, being really well planned out will not only help you, but it will really help the students to know as far ahead as they can go. So a lot of teachers were creating like interactive Google calendars or Google Google tables to be able to, you know, show like on Monday, this is what we're doing. Here's the resources on Tuesday. This is what we're doing. Here's the resources on Wednesday. Here's the resources. Here's what we're doing. So it's going to be very essential to break that up amongst the teams to make sure that those resources are getting done. But what's so great about that is that those resources just need to be very small change in modification for next year. So you're not reinventing this huge wheel, make thousands and thousands of copies. So really being very well planned out. And what you need to understand as industry leaders is you have to give teachers this time to make this happen. This is a huge switch, a very large change that we've seen and we never give teachers enough time. So you need to rethink, I've mentioned this before, the professional development piece, but giving teachers time. How can you give teachers time to support them, to help them plan what it is that they need ahead of time. And administrators, you also need to be doing some planning about how you're gonna communicate with your parents. Let's say they can't access you know, uh, the school newsletter. Are you sending out to them virtually every single week as like a text message? Is it short and sweet? Can it be read? That part of it. Another thing that was extremely, extremely highlighted during this time, not the devices, not the internet access, but with students with special ed. I personally have quite a lot of friends that their students are kind of on the spectrum or regularly receive OT, maybe speech therapy. Not only were parents struggling with that piece, but also teachers struggling with that. How do I support those students that have those extra special needs? So here's where you're gonna really need to hone in with your special ed team and see what can we do to support this online learning to make it successful for these learners 
that are on either side of the spectrum and in between to support the needs that they they need to have met. We know that if, if anyone were to have been audited during this time, IEPs wouldn't have been being met. Neither were your 504 plans. And most definitely, probably not your ELLs were not being supported as greatly during this time. So what resources can we use and how can we utilize them to make learning more equitable across the board? Not even about devices or anything like that, but making making the learning more equitable. Can we break it up amongst our teammates? Do I really actually have to carry the caseload for all of, the, all of my teaching and my teach, team teachers doing the same thing? Can we as a grade level split up the tasks amongst us? And that's why the immersive experience is so empowering. And then bringing in your special ed teachers to help support you because they know those students the best. They also know how to provide those resources the best to make sure that those students are thriving in this unique experience. So really for our deep dive today, how do we support our parents? Giving them a more open door policy, giving them a bank of resources that they can utilize. How do we support our students who don't have access to technology? streamlining the programs that we do offer, making sure that we are supporting and lifting up our special ed students. It's so important. And even our enrichment students, it's so important that everybody is lifted up and that's why online immersive learning is so impactful. I will tell you that there really have not been much studies to support support the online learning piece of it, but we do know that the flipped learning model really gives students a much larger grasp of understanding. There's less teacher talk. There's more student work with the meaningful learning that they're doing. They have already received their lesson beforehand and now they're able to have that teacher conversation and you're actually able to help those students more. I also had a couple of conversations with just parents noticing that their students have very large learning gaps, more gaps than the other students in their household. And so they were really seeking resources of how they could help support their students. Some were going to Kumon, some were going to other types of those platforms, maybe going to Khan Academy and giving them extra support. So if we can also give those extra resources of how to support your students when you notice that they're further behind, there's no better time like now that parents are really going to understand where their students actually are. It's very hard for parents to understand that when they're not as involved with that. So that's why it's so important thinking about parents and how we can also lift them up. I know it seems very overwhelming, it can be daunting, but our parents really are our biggest supporters. And during this time, we see that, that education couldn't be more important than during this experience that we've had during COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, we know that education can really open eyes and really give students the tools that they need to thrive in the world that we live in. Let's band together, let's do this for our parents, let's make this a more equitable space for all of our students and our parents so we can continue our upward trajectory from COVID-19 and making our students matter. Their learning matter, and making them have the tools they need to thrive in this 21st century. Thank you so much for following along on this journey with me again. Remember to like, share, comment below, and any suggestions that you have for, for next topics are always welcome. As always, I'm Lena Saleh, the EdTech Guru. Bye-bye.